The traditional breakdown of the peoples of the British Isles into English, Scots, Irish, and Welsh does not capture all the cultural divisions among them, nor necessarily the sharpest cultural divisions. Britons of the same nominal ethnicity have often differed greatly according to their regional backgrounds within England or within Scotland, for example. Thus, there were large cultural differences between the Highland Scots and the Lowland Scots overseas, as there was at home, or between each of these and the Scots who settled in Ulster County, Ireland. Most of the Scots who immigrated to colonial America did so as indentured servants, whose passage was paid by Americans, for whom they would later work free for years in repayment. Highland Scots who immigrated to North America settled primarily in North Carolina, but predominated in different regions of that state from those in which the Ulster Scots were concentrated. Language differences long kept the Highland Scots separate from other Scots and from the American population in general, for Highland Scots still spoke Gaelic in nineteenth-century America, and in parts of the region in which they settled, Gaelic had still not died out completely, even in the late twentieth century. The Highland Scots who immigrated to Australia in the early nineteenth century likewise spoke Gaelic and required translators, as well as being largely illiterate and unskilled. While the subsidized emigration schemes which took them to Australia were criticized in the Highlands for having taken the cream of the local working population, in Australia the criticism was that these Highlanders were the dregs of the Scottish emigration. Given the differences between the Highlanders and the Lowlanders at that juncture, there was no necessary inconsistency between these two claims. Most of the lowland Scots came from urban, industrial, and commercial areas of Scotland and went to similar areas in Australia. Even those lowlanders who worked in agriculture came from a background of agriculture in Scotland that was advanced for its time. But many of the Scottish shepherds in Australia were highlanders, reflecting in their new homeland one of the patterns of the old. Though Australia and New Zealand attracted more than half of all Scots emigrating from the British Isles in the middle of the nineteenth century, the proportion of Highlanders among them declined over time, suggesting that the adverse comments about them might have had some basis, and, thereafter, more than ninety percent of the Scots arriving in Australia were Lowlanders. Among Scots in general, however, there was a remarkable record of achievements overseas. Unlike the Highland Scots or the Ulster Scots, most Scots immigrating from Scotland to the United States, for example, did not form enclaves, but tended to assimilate into the general population. They were noted for their industriousness, and many brought industrial skills still scarce in America. Even in the late twentieth century, Americans of Scottish ancestry had incomes significantly above the national average. Scots in general achieved prominence and prosperity in America from the beginning. Nine men of Scottish ancestry were generals under George Washington, constituting more than one-third of all his brigadiers. Nearly one-fifth of the members of the Congress that adopted the Declaration of Independence were of Scottish extraction, as were two-thirds of the governors of the original thirteen states. Over time, more than a hundred men of Scottish ancestry became governors of American states, and thirty percent of all U.S. Supreme Court justices from 1789 to 1882 were of Scottish ancestry. In Australia as well, most Scots blended into the general population rather than maintaining separate enclaves, though the Highlanders among them sometimes tended to remain socially and culturally distinct longer. The first Scots arriving in Australia, like the first people of many other backgrounds, were convicts. However, the Scots were numerically underrepresented among these convicts, though they were said to be among the worst criminals, since Scottish courts were more reluctant to sentence any but the worst criminals to transportation to Australia. However, even in this early colonial period, there were also distinguished Scots in the colony, including Lachlan Macquarie and Sir Thomas Brisbane, both of whom became governors of New South Wales. The Scots' long traditions as fighting men were reflected in their military careers overseas. In the British military forces in India in the 18th century, one-third of the officers came from Scotland, though in Britain itself Englishmen alone outnumbered Scots about five to one in the population at that time. The long military tradition of the Scots kept them in demand as soldiers on the continent of Europe as well. In France and in Poland, 
there were royal bodyguards of Scots, and thousands of Scots fought in the Swedish army during the Thirty Years' War. Scots also played an important role in modernizing Russia's military and naval forces. A Scot attained the rank of general in late seventeenth-century Russia, and in the eighteenth century another Scot became a vice-admiral. As early as the sixteenth century, a Scottish military man was made governor of Kiev, and in the eighteenth century another Scot became governor of Kronstadt, while yet another became governor of the Ukraine. There were also Scottish generals in Prussia and in the Habsburg Empire. In the Western Hemisphere, there was a Scottish vice-admiral in the Chilean Navy in the 19th century, and Venezuela's battle for independence was aided by a Scottish officer who led Aboriginal Indian troops into battle to the sound of bagpipes while dressed in his traditional Highland regalia. As in Scotland itself, commerce and industry were fields in which Scots excelled overseas both as workers and as entrepreneurs. These enterprises were not simply Scottish firms with overseas branches or operations. Often they were firms with no connection to Scotland, except for the Scottish ancestry of the people who founded them and ran them, though many also sent back to Scotland for employees. Scottish merchant firms operated in China, India, Australia, Africa, the United States, and Canada. An eighteenth-century Scotsman named Simon McTavish became known in Canada as the uncrowned king of the fur trade. Half of the board of directors of the first bank established in Canada were Scotsmen, and Scots were also prominent among bankers in Australia and India, while in Japan a Scotsman established a school of banking, whose Japanese students went on to become their country's bankers in later years. There were enough Scots in Meiji-era Japan to organize lodges in Yokohama, Kobe, and Nagasaki. Meanwhile, many ships for the Japanese Navy were built in Scotland. Shipbuilding was also a skill that the Scots took with them to other countries. As early as 1798, Scottish firms were constructing ships in Canada, and a year later, one of them was building the largest ship ever built in the maritime provinces up to that time. By the early 19th century, a Scottish firm in Canada had the largest fleet of ships in the British Empire, employing 5,000 men on these ships and in the shipyards, as well as 15,000 men in the Canadian forests from which their timber came. The first plate-iron floating dry dock in Latin America was built by a Scotsman, its inventor, in 1863. In other fields as well, Scots had notable careers abroad. There were Scottish scholars teaching in French and German universities. A Scot pioneered in metallurgy and machine-building in Tsarist Russia. As businessmen, Scots ranged from peddlers to large-scale merchants and bankers, and operated from the villages of Poland to the fur-trading outposts of Canada. There were so many Scots in Holland that there was a Scottish church in Rotterdam. In the seventeenth century, an estimated thirty thousand Scots lived in Poland. Most worked as peddlers. Like most middleman minorities who have taken on the role of peddlers and shopkeepers, the Scots faced local resentment and discriminatory laws designed to restrict their economic activities, not only in Poland but in Prussia as well. In Poland, political attacks on Scots linked them with the classic middleman minority, the Jews. Nevertheless, some Scottish merchants in Poland became members of Polish guilds and other Scots became town councillors, aldermen, and even burgermeisters. The first sugar refinery in Danzig, present-day Gdansk, was built by a Scot. Some members of the Scottish nobility also immigrated to Poland and became part of the Polish nobility. 